All right. I, uh, another break has concluded, and we are soldiering our way on through. Um, I've had a lovely time meeting everybody and being here, and I have to say, this is one of the most polite places I've ever been. It's what I imagine Canada would be like, but, you know, I, I don't know, less French maybe. Um, <laughs> Ah, so as we continue on, um, this next speaker, we need to make sure to wrangle folks and bring them in. You know, whether you call religion a virus to be cured, a virus that infects, um, religion is poison, as the great late Christopher Hitchens uh, would say, or whether you just think it's something that's annoying and used to control your sexuality and take 10% of your income, at minimum, um, it is something that whether one chooses to leave it or whether you just don't have a choice anymore, um, there are services that you find you need. There are influences you find you have to work to get over and that can take some doing. That can take uh, a lot of different forms. And Recovering from Religion is an organization that helps people as they make their way from faith to reason. Um, come on up here. Sarah Moorhead is the executive director of Recovering from Religion. And she's also <laughs> Atheist of the Year 2013. My friend with beautiful children. She's beautiful too, but your kids, I mean, whoa, seriously. And um, an awesome hubby who is a great guy. So come on up, Sarah. Please tell us how to recover from religion. Right. Obviously, Janelle is a little taller than me. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here on Sunday afternoon. After everybody hopefully had a great time last night partying a little bit with friends. Um, I'm Sarah Moorhead. I'm the executive director of Recovering from Religion. So a couple things that we're going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to tell you about my life and my history and how I came to Recovering from Religion. And then I'm going to get to a short bit about what we do and who we help and why we do that. Hopefully, if we have enough time at the end, I would love to take questions. But I'm a talker, so I can't make promises. We'll see how it goes. So first of all, my own background, um, I grew up evangelical Southern Baptist. Any other Southern Baptist, former Southern Baptist in here? Got some hands? I know we're in Utah, so we're the minority now, right? So evangelical Southern Baptist, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, we believed that we were brought on this earth to tell other people the message of Jesus Christ, bring them to salvation. Um, if someone were sitting next to me in a park bench, I would believe firmly that God put them there so that I could tell them the gospel and get them saved. My church was my life. So growing up my entire life and even in young adulthood, um, I was in church at least twice on Sundays, several times during the week for Bible study, youth group, fellowship on Friday, Saturday nights, all of that. So church is everything in our community. I believe that sin came from the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, there was nothing we did wrong as an individual, but we did collectively as a human race screw up, and that was our fault. I believed in baptism by immersion. Now, there's different kinds of baptism. Some people do sprinkles. Some people have a cup poured onto them. Um, how many people did sprinkles or cups or were babies when they were baptized? A lot of people here. It didn't count for you, and I prayed for all of you. Apparently, it didn't work well either. Um, I believed in salvation through the cross, and I believed it being saved by grace through faith. And those are things I'm going to talk about in a little bit as far as loaded language, because those things to people who aren't familiar with that, that doesn't even make a lot of sense. But it means something to people who come from that background. And there were lots of rules, mostly about Sundays, mostly for girls, and mostly something related to sex. So if you boil all the rules down, what do you get? Religion in and of itself teaches people that you're broken, that you're lost, that you need a savior, you're unworthy, you have a hole in your heart, and who can fill it? Exactly. 
So what I believe. At that time in my life, when I was, I was growing up religious, and I was seeing women being taught in our religious community, and as I became a young adult, I studied Proverbs 31 very diligently. For those who aren't familiar, I was actually going to put the entire thing up here, um, but it's really long, and it's not worth it. Um, but this is a good bullet point summary, and it's kind of the, the esteemed perfection of what a woman is supposed to be in, in that viewpoint, in that religion. My life was not mine to control, and trying to control it was a sin against God. And that's a really important key point to people who are really trying to reconsider the role of religion in their life. When you grow up being told that your entire identity is made up of this religious belief system, then when you're disconnecting from that religious belief system, it's hard to figure out at that point what your identity actually is. It's all intertwined, and they work hard at making sure it is. Everything is God's will, and that also meant that I believed God would bring me my husband. Now, what that ended up being was um, a husband who wasn't necessarily the best choice. And the reason, honestly, is because he followed a whole lot of the same principles. He was a promise keeper. This is my first husband. He was a promise keeper. He was a Bible-believing Christian. Um, he was an inerrant word Christian. And that ended up having some pretty major ramifications on our marriage. As a wife, as a Christian, dutiful wife, one of the things we studied in Bible class, women's only Bible class, of course, was Ephesians, wives submit to your husbands, all of that. One of the books that we studied was created to be his helpmeet. And that is an actual term in the religious community. I've had a lot of people say, well, what on earth is a helpmeet? Um, a helpmeet is essentially a supportive, submissive wife to her husband. She does everything he says. She's towing the line, all of that. When I was looking for graphics for all of this, I stumbled onto the, uh, the quote at the bottom. The truth is, I am no more qualified to head my household than I was to receive salvation from God. And I thought that is the most perfect summary of what a lot of women believe who are growing up in this mindset. You're unworthy of salvation. You're unworthy to head your household. You're unworthy to even make decisions in your household. And it's all your fault. Weakness is something that is, again, back to that loaded language concept, um, taught to women and, and taught to children as well as something to be valued. Being weak in the eyes of the Lord gives God his power. Um, they take words and they twist them to mean different things so that as people are trying to reach out into the rest of the world outside of the religious viewpoint, they hear those words and they hearken back to what their teachings were. So when we say to people, we, you don't have to be weak, they think to themselves and say, well, weakness isn't a bad thing. Weakness gives God power. They don't realize that we don't realize a lot of times by empowering them with our language, we're actually reinforcing some of the beliefs they already have. And that's an important key as we're going through this. A lot of people will talk to more, re more liberal religious viewpoints, and you'll hear them say things like, well, the Bible doesn't actually teach that you're not worthy. It doesn't actually, it's, it's a book of love. Luke 17, 10, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done our duty. It's in the Bible. It's there. No matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you obey, no matter how much you do everything you are told to do, you're still not good enough. When you grow up thinking that way and approaching everything in your life that is out of your control, you're not good enough, you're never able to take control of your own destiny. You're never able to make decisions that empower you in a direction of healthy relationships, healthy lifestyle, healthy choices, all of that. So what happened? Obviously, I am no longer a Proverbs 31 woman, or even attempting to be. Um, basically, my husband and I were very involved in our church. We taught Sunday school. We taught Awanas, if anyone's familiar with Awanas. It's a, it's a kid's program to teach them to memorize the Bible. Um, all of our kids were in Awanas. We did Bible studies. We tithed. 
everything. My husband increasingly became more physically aggressive as the years went on. Our church never spoke out against domestic violence. In fact, they basically turned the other way and, and had this idea of, well, if, if they need it to keep them in line because they're not submissive enough, you know, just don't do it too much. The problem, aside from the obvious, is that when you're empowering men that they are being told by God how to rule their household and how to domineer the women in their lives and how to domineer their children, and they don't have healthy communication tools and they don't have relationships and boundaries that are in, the, in a functional relationship. It can very quickly go downhill, and that's what happened with me. Um, for years, my husband had been very physically aggressive towards me. He was emotionally abusive. He was physically abusive. Um, there came a day where my daughter, my oldest daughter, she was tween at the time, about 11 or 12. So she was getting to that independent, outspoken kind of age. And she mouthed off to him. And he lost his temper. Now, he had been coming after me for years. Um, for whatever reason, I, I had rationalized it. I still remember thinking and praying this way. I was an adult. I, you know, I was in this relationship. It was what God wanted for me to suffer through for eternal salvation, whatever. But the moment he went after my daughter, he picked her up and he threw her against the wall. And she was not a small kid. Not that it would have mattered, but still. Um, the moment he did that, that was it for me. And I don't know why. I, I honestly, to this day, don't know why that was the line and not many lines before that. But I made him leave. And he left, and I did the only thing I knew to do, which was to go to my church. Because where else do you turn? You don't go to the police. Tried that before, and they believed him. Um, so I went, to the, I went to my church. And my church... They have a benevolence committee, and a lot of churches have these, so if you're not familiar with them, a benevolence committee is a, is a panel of individuals, which at my church was all men, big shock, and their job is to decide how to hand out benevolence funds or, or helping the needy, funds that help the needy in their community. So I went to the benevolence committee, and I told them what had happened. I'm not really sure, I don't really remember exactly what I was expecting, um, but I told them that I needed $600 to help pay the rent and get some food. That uh, gives you an idea of what kind of a neighborhood we lived in, that that was enough to help, but regardless. Um, and they said they needed to pray about it. They needed God's guidance. So I waited for God to give them whatever guidance they needed. And they called me back in, and they said they had prayed about it. God said no. God apparently strongly preferred that I come to marriage counseling by myself so that I could learn how to pray my husband back to Christ. Because his failings as a husband and a father were obviously a reflection of my devotion to God. I wish I was joking. So saying all of that, one thing I like to ask um, when I'm giving this talk is um, just shout out everybody, How, um, what size town do you think I, I was living and growing up in, all of that? Just shout it out. Small town, big town. Everybody says small. I grew up in Houston, Texas. The reason I always try to make that point is because there's a huge misconception that inerrant word fundamentalism, that this kind of patriarchy is confined to small backwoods towns. And in our brains, we compartmentalize this into tiny little groups of people that yes, it matters, and yes, we care about them, but there's really not that many, and that's wrong. The churches that I'm referencing that I grew up in, that I spent my young adult life in, had thousands and thousands of members. They're still around today. They're big. They're not even the biggest ones in their area. Um, but there are more, and there are more that are even more fundamentalist than them. They don't look like it on the outside, 
but the more involved you get, the more they teach you the right way to be a Christian. So as I was leaving this meeting, I was going out the door, it was, you know, glass door. I pushed on it to leave. And I wasn't paying attention because I was crying. I was a little upset. It wasn't really what I was hoping for. Um, and I ran into a guy that was on the other side of the door. And I glanced down and I realized what he was doing. So just as a quick review, God was not okay with me having $600 to pay my bills and take care of my kids. The guy was putting some kind of glass etching or whatever on the, on the windows of the doors around this big mega church. God's totally cool with glass etching. He had a real problem with me helping my family. That wasn't the moment I became an atheist. It would be a great story if it was, but that was not the moment I became an atheist. It was the moment the seed was planted and I realized that something wasn't right. I wasn't sure what, but something wasn't right. So that was the beginning of a very long process for me. Um, the hardest part was realizing how alone I was because word travels fast in your church. And when you're having marriage troubles, they don't really want you around. It's contagious. They will actually say that. Marriage troubles are contagious. Um, so very quickly, this community that I thought I had, that we'd always been around for potlucks and we took each other casseroles when babies were born and people were in the hospital and, and all this stuff just suddenly vanished. They just weren't there. A few nights later, there was a knock at my back door. And in my neighborhood, I mean, you know, we, we were not in the best neighborhood. It was, you know, um, there was an alley behind us and there was a house that was kind of catty corner. And the people that lived in this house, there were two gentlemen, and I was sure they were brothers or friends or something. Um, don't get ahead of me. Come on. But I remember we would watch them. They had crazy bumper stickers. They had a flag up in their backyard that had a circle and an upside down star. They had friends over and they would wear these robes and they would sing these songs that were really creepy and they would have a fire and everything. So we would pray for them through our window and tell our kids to stay away because obviously they were satanic, clearly. There was a knock on my back door and I opened it up and it was one of the gentlemen from that house. And he said, I brought you a casserole. I know you're going through some stuff. And if you need anything, we're right over here. I can watch your kids. If you need to run some errands, I can help. I can grab some groceries. We're broke, but you will help however we can. I don't think I've ever been more confused in my life. I firmly believed that God was testing me. I really did. I believed that God was putting these people in front of me to challenge my faith. <laughs> I hear people laughing. I'm really serious. It's funny now, but... Um, and ultimately, I got to know these people very well. And as you probably surmise, um, they were an out and proud gay couple. Um, they ran their local coven um, for... Uh, they were witches. And I'm not completely familiar with all of that, and I don't care anymore, but um, they were very happy, very wonderful people. But one of the things they did, aside from not be hypocrites, was to just very patiently entertain my questions. Because I had never encountered Satanists before. It was amazing, and they were so nice to me. So I would talk to them, and I would say, now, Explain to me why you're not afraid of hell, even though you know you're going. <laughs> Did I mention that they were very patient people? <laughs> but the point is, they didn't laugh at me, they didn't ridicule, well, they giggled a little, but, you know, now we all know why. Um, but they entertained my questions. They allowed me to have the discussion. They didn't push, they didn't tell me why I was wrong. They just said, this is what we believe. And, and I, again, that wasn't when I became an atheist. That was when I started considering the possibilities outside of my own belief system. They gave me a safe place to do that. 
I could ask those questions. I got real answers. They gave me book recommendations that weren't from my pastor. That was kind of interesting. I started going to the library and I started reading books that were not on the approved list from the church bookstore. Ultimately, and, and I'm, I am sad to report that they both were HIV positive and they both passed away some years ago. Um, and that honestly is probably one of the greatest losses to humanism because they were a fantastic example of that. Um, I think they did more in the early stages of my walking away from religion than anyone else um, could have at that point. They were exactly what I needed at the time. But I started reading and I started exploring and I stumbled onto Dan Barker's book, Godless, eventually, which was eye-opening that there were other people, a minister nonetheless, who had done the same thing and walked away from faith. Um, I don't remember when I became an atheist. I remember the moment I considered the possibility that American Baptists might not be going to hell. It was that microscopic for me. And it is for so many people. Once the card started to fall, it went pretty quickly, but it took a long time to get those gears going. It took a long time for that seed to start growing. So how does this happen? We already know one population that the churches reach out to, they evangelize to over and over again, and it's children. Does anybody know the other group, the other population of people where they put the most money and the most of their resources? Prisons. They intentionally go after disadvantaged, vulnerable people who are looking for answers. And of course, children are an easy target for that because they want answers to everything. But so are people who are going through their life and it's not working out the way they want it to. They intentionally prey on the vulnerable and the needy. So we'll talk a second about the loaded language. And this is something that's really important to me to convey to all of you. Because a lot of times we get in these conversations, we get in these debates, and we don't realize how much we're playing right into their own fears and we're playing right into their own stereotypes without even meaning to. I'm talking about even just the nicest conversations. So some examples of loaded language, anointed and appointed, and I won't get into describing all of them. Joyful is one that, that is interesting. If you guys hear people, especially um, inerrant word, fundamentalist types, talking about being joyful, um, joy is Jesus, others, yourself. God first, everybody else, you're always last. That's joyful. Um, keep sweet, caught in the spirit, leaning on the cross as an example of joy. So these are all, this is all language that's internal. It, they're talking about in their own communities with each other. It makes sense to them. Secular, humanist, and atheist. Those words don't mean the same things in their community that it does to us. I grew up being taught that secular means Satan and humanist means hell, and atheist is anyone who is not saved and born again. Which is why, has anyone seen Kirk Cameron's thing on Way of the Master where he talks about he used to be an atheist? Quite a few people. Okay. Here's what he means. He doesn't mean he used to reject a belief in God. He means he hadn't converted to his latest version of being right. That's all he means. And most of them, when they're talking about atheism, that's what they're talking about. The idea of a lack of belief in God entirely is really a foreign concept. I'm trying to go through these enough so we have time for questions if we can. So how does recovering from religion help this process? We have local meetings that meet monthly all over the country. We're growing across the world. We started off with 25 groups found when we were founded by Dr. Dale Ray in 2009. We now have over 100. We're expanding into Canada, the UK, and Australia. We have, thank you. We have online support groups um, for people who are questioning, people who are non-believers but closeted. We have an online support page for people of mixed marriages, so they are non-believers, but they're married to believers. That's a very unique situation, and they have a lot of stuff they talk about. We just started an online support page for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And we have support pages for people, um, the C2C and the PK. We have support pages for people who are connected to clergy 
and preacher's kids because that's another population of people. It's a very unique thing when you're constantly on display in the fishbowl and everyone in the congregation is waiting to see what you do to screw up next. And then you turn up being an atheist. That's a tough deal. We have the Secular Therapist Project. If you haven't heard of that yet, please check it out. The Secular Therapist <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> the Secular Therapist Project um, is a project of Dr. Dale Ray's we're extremely proud of. Um, it matches up secular therapists with clients in an anonymous way. It's a completely free resource. And we are proud to say we've helped out our 3,000th client last month. We are growing by leaps and bounds. The concept of secular therapy, a lot of people say, well, isn't that just therapy? And yes, it is supposed to be. Um, there's really no such thing as religious therapy, at least not in the evidence-based community. Um, science. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of communities, because people are religious, these therapists will infuse their own religious viewpoints into the therapeutic process. It is unethical, it's not okay, but they do it anyways, and a lot of times they don't even know that it's wrong. They don't understand that it's wrong. So we have people coming to us saying, you know, I'm, I'm just having problems in my marriage. I don't need to be told to pray or go back to church, but that's what they keep telling me. So they can come to the Secular Therapist Project, they can put in their information, and they will anonymously be matched up with a therapist near them. And we also have therapists that do distance counseling. So if there's not one near them, they're able to connect to someone who can still help. Finally, we have the Hotline Project. I would have loved to tell you that the Hotline Project launched today. That was the goal. Like every good plan, it gets delayed. We're a little bit behind on it, but it's coming very, very soon. We're training volunteers right now. And the Hotline Project is going to be an 800 number project, people or phone number. People will be able to call they'll be able to talk to a trained agent who will be walking them through this process. Now, here's the thing. Recovering from Religion is not an atheist evangelical organization. Our goal is not deconversion. That tends to happen anyways. That is a bonus. That is not our fault. <laughs> Basically, people come to us with questions that they're not getting answered in their own communities. What we do is we provide practical resources, a community they can talk to, books they can read, blogs they can go to, other resources outside of their own viewpoint so they can consider all aspects of what they're trying to accomplish. I'm being told I have five minutes. I'm going to go as fast as I can. So how to get involved with Recovering from Religion. We are a completely volunteer organization, me included. We need your help. We're a 501c3 organization. If you support what we're trying to do, if you want to help us be that bridge, be that transition for people to come through so that they can get to the secular community, we need you to help us with your financial support. That's number one. Number two, if you are a secular therapist or if you know someone who is, please point them to the Secular Therapy Project so they can register. We also have a gentleman at our table. His name is Dwight. He is a therapist. He is doing a research project on people, on the efficacy of therapy based on whether or not their therapist in, used religion or did not use religion. If you've been in any kind of therapy, religious or not, please stop by the table and talk to Dwight. He wants to talk to you. We want to be able to show whether or not the influence of religion in therapy is a detriment or not to the process of getting better with your mental health. The Hotline Project and starting an RR group in your area, we absolutely need volunteers for those. We will never have enough volunteers, so please don't think you're not wanted. We do need you, and there's other volunteer areas on the website. Finally, change is a process, not an event. Religion teaches that you are broken and you are doomed by your own creator. And I want you to think about that for just a second. The very creature, the very entity that made you, made you broken on purpose so that you would go back to him and need him more. These stories, the one I told you about mine, it's not any more unique than anyone else's. Your stories, the stories that are yet to be told, these are the consequences of inerrant belief. These are the consequences of faith. And these stories, this is why the secular community needs recovering from religion. Thank you.
boy, do we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you, Sarah, 2013 American Atheist of the Year. That's why.